Nobody say anything bad. We're <laughs> the Welcome, everybody. Um, this is Sue Nakamishi at the Langley Adams Library. I'm going to come over here so maybe you can see me real quick. I'll be, hopefully, you can see me on camera. Hi, we're in the Langley Adams Library in Groveland, and we've got a full house and our library tonight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not. And we, I hear we have a lot of people Zooming. And I, before I start, I just want to say thank you very much to Tewksbury's Library, Robert Hayes, who's my um, partner in crime here, not to make a pun here. <laughs> but um, it's thanks to Tewksbury, we're using their Zoom account this evening. And we have people from Groton, and we have people from Chelmsford, and people from all across the country Zooming tonight. Wow. And I'm, we're very excited. So Colleen Cambridge is a New York Times bestselling author of the American Paris Mysteries and the Felita Bright Mysteries. And um, the first one is Murder at Malowin Hall, which got an Agatha uh, Award. Nomination. Okay. Nomination yeah. The first book, first book in the, um, both series were Indie Next Picks for the American Bookseller Association. Um, mastering the art of French uh, murder, which I'm in the middle of right now, and I'm, it's hard for me to put it down. I'm being honest. Uh, so it's, if you listen to it, the narrator is awesome, doing a great job. Um, was also an April 2023 book reads library read selection. She is an accomplished historian whose meticulously researched novels appeal to fans of historical fiction, yes, and mysteries alike. She also writes under the pen name C.M. Gleason and Colleen Gleason. She lives in Michigan, yes. Yes. in Ohio, oh, an hour yeah, south right. of Toledo. And my niece is here tonight from Indianapolis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, without further ado, I am so honored to have Colleen. I have Zoomed with her a couple times. My mystery book club, which I have a lot of my members, you guys can raise your hands if you're my mystery yes, book club. <laughs> we read um, your the, a trace of poison. We did we did the um, Agatha Christie book and then read it. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you made that recommendation. And mm -hmm. so anyway, I am not going to keep stealing her thunder. I'm going to turn it over to her and let her take over the talking. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Sue, it's really fabulous to be here in person because like Sue said, we've Zoomed a couple times and she keeps saying, I just love for you to, to get here in person and here we are. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start by telling kind of a story about how I ended up writing this book, Mastering the Art of French Murder. And it's kind of a long convoluted story, but um, along the way, you might get some little nuggets of interest. Some of you may have heard this story before, if you've heard me Zoom before. But basically, I, I write historical mysteries that feature um, mm -hmm. famous people as like the sidekick or the, or the side character. And how I got to be doing this is kind of, I hope you find it so, sort of amusing and maybe interesting as well. I've written a whole bunch of books. Um, I just finished writing my 49th full-length novel, oh, which is the follow-up to this book, which um, comes out tomorrow. The one, this book comes out tomorrow, the follow-up I just finished writing, my 49th novel. I've written everything from vampire hunters to action-adventure thrillers to um, sus uh, romantic suspense, ghost stories, and post-apocalyptic romance, if you can believe it. Think The Walking Dead with a lot of hot sex. Okay. So um, I've done a lot of different things. So I was, I want, this was, you know, maybe, it must be like seven or eight years ago now, maybe a little bit longer, maybe nine years ago. I wanted to write a book, um, a book of my heart. And uh, if you talk to authors or writers, a lot of us will talk about the book of our heart, the book we have to write, the book that won't let us go. And it's something we write even if we don't maybe have a contract or no, but or maybe no one's interested in it. So I wrote a book um, that uh, is now called Murder on the Champs Elysees. And it was about, it was set in Paris in 1900. And the main character was a gay homicide detective in Belle Epoque, Paris. And I wrote this book, poured my heart and soul into it, and nobody wanted to publish it. This was, you know, maybe 2000, it had to have been like, 17, 16, somewhere in there. So 
um, we were about to, you know, kind of, we, every, every editor passed on it. My, my agent had taken it out. And again, I'd written, you know, 30 some novels by then. So it wasn't like I was a brand new writer, but this was something different for me. It was a historical mystery, which I think is my absolute favorite genre to read and to write. And I'll talk more about why that is a little bit later. Anyway, the editor at Kensington, who is my editor now, um, loved the book, but couldn't um, offer to publish it. And so instead, she called my agent and she said, I really like Colleen's writing. I think she's got this, this you know, talent for historical fiction with a murder in it. Would Colleen be interested in writing something else for us? And so, of course, as a writer, I'm not going to say no to a potential publishing contract. So my editor or my agent calls me and she says, so they want you to write a murder mystery series with Abraham Lincoln solving murders while he's president. Uh huh. I was kind of like, huh. And my agent was very excited, but I was like, um, Lincoln's kind of busy running the country. He's got a country at war. He's got a wife who's difficult. He's the president of the United States. I don't think he has time to solve murders. But I said, what if Lincoln is, you know, the friend or the mentor or a, a very strong supporting character in this series? And I create my own character, my own protagonist. And one of the reasons I like to do that, or I wanted to do that, was not only because I was terrified to write too much about Lincoln, because everybody knows about Lincoln, and a lot of people know a lot of stuff about Lincoln, and I didn't want to mess that up. But also, when I can create my own character and drop them in a historical setting with people we know that were real, that gives me more leeway. I mean, we all know Lincoln's story. None of that's a surprise to us. We don't get to see a character development over a series of books that might be murders, murder mysteries. But if I create my own protagonist, then I have a lot more leeway and I can write about his life, his relationships, his backstory. Fortunately, the editor loved the idea. So I wrote three books. And if you look on your little card, because this is your cheat sheet here, <laughs> um, Murder in the Lincoln White House was the first book in that series. And as um, Sue mentioned, I write under the name C.M. Gleason. And so that book was published under C.M. Gleason. So I wrote three books in this series with Lincoln as the mentor and friend of Adam Quinn, who is the main, um, he's the protagonist. And then there's a young woman named Sophie Gates who decides that she wants to help solve murders too. So the two of them, plus a doctor, um, Dr. George Hilton, are involved in solving murders in this series. So I wrote three books in this series. Unfortunately, the books didn't do as well as we had hoped at that time for a number of reasons, nobody's fault. But um, I will say that people who read the books keep asking me if there's going to be more. There just weren't enough people who read the books. So if you like the Civil War, you like Lincoln, you're interested in very deep historical fiction, you might like this series. Anyway, wrote three books in that series. <clears throat> then one day my editor called my agent and said, not sure we're going to do any more Lincoln books, but... Could, would Colleen be interested in writing a murder mystery series featuring Agatha Christie's housekeeper as the protagonist? And I about jumped out of my skin. That was a yes, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Agatha Christie's housekeeper. I grew up reading Agatha Christie. I have a thing for Urku Poirot. I think Agatha is brilliant, was brilliant. I mean, her books still hold up. And besides that, you know, golden age murder mystery, you know, English country house murder. That was the whole thing that was running through my head. So um, I love that idea. I was very grateful that they came to me with the idea. And so I wrote um, this book, Murder at Malin Hall, which is the first book in the series. Um, it was very, pretty well received. As you mentioned, it was an Agatha nominee and it was an Indie Next pick. And um, it, the third book in this series comes out tomorrow. So you guys get a preview of it tonight. Um, so it's basically Agatha Christie at Downton Abbey. She never lived in a home like Downton Abbey. She had a couple different homes, but in my book, it's complete fiction this um, this uh, estate that she lives at with her husband, her second husband, Max Mallowan. And the main character is Philida Bright, who is the housekeeper. And so basically one morning, Philida comes downstairs and there is a dead body in Agatha Christie's own library. Body in the library, Agatha Christie. <laughs> so I thought, oh, it's gonna be fun. So that, that's the first book in the series. And I went on to write another couple. And then um, I'm actually just finished, like I said, the fourth book and I'll be working on the fifth book soon as well. So that series was doing okay. And then all of a sudden my editor calls me directly one day and she said, Colleen, since you since you're not writing the Lincoln books anymore and we think you could do another series, would you be interested in writing a murder mystery series with Julia Child in Paris, solving mysteries? 
and I was like, Julia Child, Paris, food, Paris, Julia Child, yes. Um, but then I said, well, what about like Julia Child being the, the friend, like Agatha Christie is the friend in the, in the Philida books. Abe Lincoln is the mentor in the Adam Quinn and Sophie Gates books. How about Julia being like, you know, the friend instead of, no, 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 no. We want Julia to be the main character. I'm like, okay, all right, okay. So I write um, a proposal for that for that book, for that series. And um, my editor loved it. Everybody at the publisher loved it. They were about to offer me a contract for it when, they re when their lawyer said, maybe not. Let's not make Julia the main character. Let's make her be the sidekick best friend. <laughs> right? But I was really, again, like I said earlier, I was kind of happy that it worked out that way because that's this book right here. Because... Um, I can do what I want with Tabitha Knight, who's Julia's best friend in this book. I can do, you know, I can give her the background I want. And we already know, you know, Julia's great story. And she only lived in Paris for two and a half ish years. So I don't really have that much time, you know, to spend with her. But she'll always be in these books. So um, Mastering the Art of French Murder was the first book in that series that came out in, at the end of April. It's, it's been well received. Sue was talking about some of the um, accolades the books received. And um, the nice thing about this is remember that book I told you about, the book of my heart that I wrote about the gay homicide detective? Well, he makes an off page appearance in this book. They talk about him. He's a friend of some of the main characters in the book. So I kind of feel like I came full circle with mm -hmm. this whole um, book of my heart. He's not in it, but he's He's still there. So anyone who's who's read that book, which has been published by a small publisher, um, you know, can make the connection. So um, as I said earlier, one of the things I my favorite genre to read and write is historical mystery. And part of the reason I've already alluded to, and that is I can take a really deep dive into a specific historical era, a specific historical time, a world. And even a deep dive into a real person's life, Abe Lincoln, Julia Child, Agatha Christie but I can still drop a bloody murder in there and I can, and I can create a whole, you know, a character who's, who's navigating this world. So I get the best of all worlds. I get the historical element. I get the mystery element and I get to develop a character the way I want to. So I'm really very, very lucky to be able to be writing the two series right now, the Philida Bright, Agatha Christie housekeeper series and the um, Tabitha Knight and American in Paris series. Um, the uh, Lincoln books are, you know, there may be more of those as time goes on. And then this other book that's on your little card is my Stoker and Holmes series, which kind of kicked me off into this whole famous person as in a historical setting. It's actually a series I wrote for teens, um, like ages 12 and up. And it's Sherlock Holmes's niece. Of course, Sherlock Holmes was not a real person, but his niece and Bram Stoker, who, of course, wrote Dracula, his sister team up in this book and it's in, in an alternate Victorian London. There's actually five books in the series. So that's kind of where I started with this whole mashing of fiction and historical people together. I'm going to take a breather, take a sip of water and see if anybody has a question. Otherwise I can just keep blathering on. <laughs> you guys might not get out of here for a while. <laughs> yeah. So what is your recipe for um, putting together a storyline? That is an excellent question because I don't have one. And the, the oh, truth yeah. is, um, I don't, well, I used to um, be able to say, I don't, do we lose something? So, I'm sorry, someone just asked, will we on Zoom get a PDF of the cheat sheet? Oh, it we was- can, We can figure out how to get them that, sure. Yeah, yeah. we'll figure that out. Sorry, guys. It, it's just a bookmark and it has a picture of her you, book. We could take pictures of it and then you could just upload it. You could take pictures yep. of both sides and then just upload it. Um, so, so up until recently, I used to not be able to, I used to not know who the murderer was in any of the murder mysteries I wrote. Yeah. With there being, you know, one or two, three, four deaths per book, I never would know who the murderer was till I got near the end and I had to make a decision. So that just goes to show I didn't have a recipe. Um, however, the last couple of books I've written, it's weird. I knew who the murderer was from the beginning and I didn't change my mind, which was interesting. Now this book, which is the third book in the um, Philadelphia Bright series. So this is the first one, Murder at Malaman Hall, A Trace of Poison. Some of you might've read here for the Mystery Book Club. This was the second one. And then this is the third one and it comes out tomorrow. This book, 
not only did I know who the murderer was from the beginning, but I wrote the murder scene three times and I changed the victim twice. So definitely no recipe. <laughs> I'm what we call fond of me, what they call a seat of the pants writer. I don't generally know what's happening in the book until it happens. Now, the reason that is, is because I grew up a voracious reader. I was one of the kids that came to the library in the summer with a, I'd leave with a stack of books this high and like three days later, I'd need to go back because I had read them all, right? Oh, okay. Wow. So um, I read and read and read. And so even when I was younger, I was running out of things to read. So I started writing my own stories. And as I got older, I, I kind of gave it a little more um, formality. Um, I went to school, went to grad school, got married, had kids, had a career. But all this while I wrote for fun for myself, trying to finish a book. Never thought I'd actually be able to do it for a living. Very, very lucky to be able to do it for a living. But um, the re the reason I uh, write the way I do is because I, I'm writing it as if I'm reading it. So I'm writing it with the same pleasure and, and you know, surprise as hopefully the reader is. I don't really know what's going to happen. I'm um, experiencing these scenes as the main character or whoever's scene I'm writing experiences it. So for me, it's the pleasure of the pleasure of writing is like reading. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that it's always fun to write because there's a lot of times when the words just don't want to come that day. But but for me, that's what so I don't, you know, plan. The scene of the murders, there's a lot of types of murders, and I'm wondering if there's some uh, tremendous hacking and slashing, or is it just someone gets shot and that's it? Well, so these, the books are, are what we call cozies. They're considered cozy oh. mysteries. They're historical set. So they're not, um, they're made, there's, they're, they're considered cozy because the violence happens off the page. You don't see the hacking and slashing. Oh, okay. They basically come upon a body that's already dead. And there might be blood. It's kind of like Agatha Christie or Murder, She Wrote or Monk or any of those. You know, <laughs> it's not it's not a it's not a book that's going to necessarily scare you. But hopefully it's a book. These are books that will intrigue you. So they're not really all about the, the you know, the hacking and slashing. The um, Lincoln books do have an element that the other two series don't have. And that is that they have a doctor in 1862, 1861, excuse me, um, Washington, D.C., who actually does a sort of postmortem. Mm -hmm. So having, um, I had to work pretty hard with those three books, and hopefully there'll be more. Um, I have a very good friend who's an emergency room doctor. 37, 40 years, he's an ER doc. So he would always work with me on what could a doctor see in 1861 and be able to figure out is something's wrong. Because they didn't do fingerprinting. They didn't do blood testing. They didn't have any idea about trace evidence, you know, looking for stuff on the ground that was left by the killer. That's all stuff that we take for granted now. They didn't do that in 1861. They hardly did it in or the 1930s. And even in the 1950s, which is the... It still wasn't common knowledge, like what, um, you know, how fingerprinting worked and how you had to have elimination fingerprints taken to make sure that they knew whose was yours and whose was possibly the murderers. Do you guys follow me? Mm -hmm. So the whole point is, is um, in the Lincoln books, I actually have a doctor and he's a black man, a free black man who was a doctor in Washington, D.C. during the Civil War doing postmortems. And I'm making it as historically accurate as I can. So that's what that's not even bloody and slashing, yeah, but it's more you know, scientific or, or um, you know, CSI-ish right. than the other books. Right. So, and you know, one of the things that, that segues for me into one of the things that I love about doing historical mystery yeah. is that it's a puzzle for me as the writer to figure out how to deliver clues to the reader and the detective, knowing what they knew at that time and knowing what they didn't know at that time and also making the clues make sense to us modern day readers who are like, well, why don't they just take fingerprints? Or why aren't they looking on the floor, you know, for, for you know, you know, um, ashes from the cigarette or whatever. They just didn't do that. They really didn't do that. Sherlock Holmes was an anomaly and he didn't even really do that. You know, he, he did a little bit of it. So, so for me, the puzzle is not only who the heck the murderer is, because I never know, um, but how to 
construct a murder mystery that makes sense for the time. For example, mm -hmm. you know, in A Trace of Poison, mm -hmm. we had poisons. And, you, you know, this is 1930s. This, this series is 1930s in England. They didn't have a lot of the tests we have for, yeah. for poisons nowadays. People would just die. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they wouldn't know that it was poison for sure. Like we might be suspicious and do all these, you know, toxicology tests. They didn't really do that. They could do some, but they couldn't do it all. So try to make sure that the trying to demonstrate to the reader and the detective that, yeah, this is really poison. You've got to pay attention to this. This wasn't just somebody who keeled over from a heart attack is one of the fun things about writing these historical uh, mystery series. Make sense? Mm -hmm. My blabbing? Mm -hmm. okay. um, questions? Want to take out a drink of water? Questions um, from the- People are saying, I'm loving this. Thank you so much. The construction of a mystery. So thank you for that comment. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, I love the name of your book, Mastering the Art of French Murder. Was that written in Paris while Julia Child was in the middle of writing her Mastering the Art of French Cooking cookbook? So, I mean, obviously I, I wrote it recently, but we came up with that title because that's exactly, well, she's in Paris, but when this book takes place, which is actually um, December 1949, she hasn't actually started writing the cookbook yet. She's actually going to Le Cordon Bleu. And it hasn't met the two other women she wrote the cookbook with. But that's, you know, we know that that's going to happen. So I thought that my publisher did an absolutely spectacular job of creating a cover that looks, that evokes the cover of Mastering the Art of French Cooking without copying it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we don't want to do that. But if you get a chance to look at it very closely, my favorite little detail, and I'll pass this around if you'd like to look at it, is the little murdery chef dude as I call oh. him fondly, on the little, he's on the knife, but he's also all over the front. And he is, um, he appears on the second cover that's coming, of the book that's coming out in April. So the little murdery chef dude is now going to be on all the covers somehow. And, um, but I think they did a brilliant job and exactly the whole point was to evoke that cookbook. And I will take credit for coming up with a with the title idea and I will take credit for it because I rarely come up with good titles. So that was one that I came up with and everybody liked because I, it just, it worked. It worked for so many reasons. So Julia Child is the best friend of my main character in this book. And what happens is my main character, Tabitha, is actually, so it's, this is 1949 Paris. So Tabitha was a Rosie the Riveter during World War II. And she worked at the Willow Run Bomber plant outside of Detroit. Of course, Tabitha's fictional, but in my head, she was a real person, right? So she worked at the Willow Run Bomber plant outside of Detroit, Michigan. Henry Ford helped, you know, get that all set up, which was two miles from where I grew up. So um, the Willow Run Bomber plant or Willow Run Airport has always been part of my, my life. I've known about it. And my grandmother, my grandfather, who couldn't enlist because he had a bad back, and my Aunt Rosie all were worked at the Willow Run Bomber plant. So I gave Tabitha Knight this background where uh, she was a Rosie, the, she worked at the bomber plant and the war is over. She ends up realizing she doesn't want to marry the guy she thought she was going to marry. She's 30 years old. She's looking for something different. And her mother is French and her mother and grandmother, you know, had come to America when the mother married her father, who was American, you know, they lived in Michigan, and the grandfather stayed in Paris. It was an amicable split. So the grandfather's been in Paris all this time. He never left. The grandmother uh, dies, and she and the mother suggests that Tabitha go to Paris and visit her grandfather. Now, Tabitha, who was raised in the U.S., of course, speaks French fluently. So she goes to Paris, and she lives with her grandpere and her, his partner, Uncle Rafe, in this beautiful home in Paris. And she befriends this woman across the street whose name is Julia Child, who's also an American. Again, this is all fictional. I made all this part up, except for the part about Julia and Paul Child and where they lived and what they did. And Julia and Tabitha would go to the market every day. And one day they come home from the market and there's a dead body on the floor in, in the basement in Julia Child's apartment building with... Julia Child's chef's knife lying next to the dead body, and there's blood on it. Spoiler alert, Julia Child did not murder anybody. But, you know, the detective is not so sure about that. So so Tabitha gets involved in trying to figure out who killed this person in Julia's house. So that's the setup for that series. And Julia, as I said, is at Le Cordon Bleu, and she's learning how to cook, and she's, you know, not quite there with the cookbook yet, but she will be. So 
that's the that's the that series is an American in Paris series with Tabitha Knight, Julia Child, friends in Paris, and Tabitha is completely fictional, and Julia's life is as accurate as I can make it in the books. And in fact, um, I will tell you one of the reasons that uh, we ended up writing having the series be not Julia Child as the main character and as the the friend is because the Julia Child mm -hmm. Foundation is very protective of, you know, Julia's name and, and anything related to her. So it was probably a good choice that we we made that. And in fact, the Julia Child Foundation has is aware of the book. They've read the book and they think it's just charming and fun. So fortunately, um, yeah. you know, they they were happy. They were fine with it. So that was a that was a good thing. So there will be more in that series, too. There'll be more in the Philip Bright series. There may be more in the watch in the Abraham Lincoln series. So. Yeah. Is there any exchange of money to use her name? No, mm -hmm. no. Um, there, you know, she is a, a a a public figure, so there is some ability to you know to use her entity, but you know you don't want to go too far. So we wouldn't have wanted to make her the main character in the book. Yeah. No, there's not. There's none of that, fortunately. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Is there certain subjects that you feel that a publisher may be more up to publish it if they're interested in what you give them? Yeah, I mean, you know, publishers know publishers know what they do well and what kinds of books they do well. And so, you know, if if a book that's presented maybe doesn't fit in what they know they do well, they're probably less likely to take that on because it's more of a of a what if, yeah. you know. Um, for now, I will. I do want to say that it's not common for a publisher to come to a, a writer and say, "Would you like to do this idea? Would you write this series for us?" I consider myself extremely, extremely lucky that that happened not once, not twice, but three times. Wow. Um, part of the reason I think is because I've written so I had written books prior to, so they knew I could write a book or more than one book. But also um, because my editor has, you know, has faith in in my ability to um, to pull these ideas together. And if you do read any of these four books on that little cheat sheet, you will notice that the voices, the feel, not just because of the time period, but they're they're different. the The Julia Child and um, Tabitha Knight series is written in first person from Tabitha's point of view. You know, the Malowin Hall Philip Bright series is written very Britishy. In a, not, and not from Philida's point of view. I mean, we see most of, but it's not written first person. And it feels, I hope it feels very Agatha Christie-esque, you know? So, and then the um, Abe Lincoln books are very American sounding, you know, there's lots of reckons and, you know, and it's and it's not first person either, but they all sound different. They all are different voices. They're all different experiences, which part of the reason is because they're in different time periods, but I also wanted to make sure that the, the feeling didn't leak from one series to the other. I want them to be disparate. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I want it, you know, and so, which means that you might like, somebody might love the Philip Bright series and not like the, the American in Paris series, you know, because they're different, mm -hmm. but you'll like them all. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> just give them all a shot. Um, yeah, Sue. I just wanted to say that this stuck in my head. Um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking out on the, the main character in, um, the art of the front turn. Oh, it? Tabitha Knight. Tabitha. She is um, about to go outside. She lives across, she's in the apartment, the house across from Julia Child's apartment. And it's really cold. And she comments about how she wishes she could just throw on a pair of trousers because back in Michigan, when she was working in the plants, women were allowed to wear pants. But in Paris, it was against the law. And I, I, that just really blew my mind. Well, it was technically against the law. And you didn't see a lot of women wearing trousers around that time in Paris. I don't, and I don't think anybody would have at that point would have been hauled off to jail, but you never know. But, you know, um, they, they were allowed to wear trousers. They were, it, so technically it was illegal for a woman to wear trousers unless she was riding a horse or riding a bicycle. Now, again, you know, I, I know some women probably did, but they really didn't. If you look at pictures, and I've looked at so many pictures of people, women in particular, because I'm looking at the clothing in that time period, all the pictures, Paul Child, who was quite the photographer, as many of you know, 
took of Julia. There is not one of her in trousers, not one of all the pictures I've seen. Mm -hmm. None of the women are in trousers, are in slacks at all. Now, I know that in the Bohemian areas, you know, on the left bank, there were women who would wear slacks, but it really was not common. So, and like I said, technically it was illegal. You know, I don't know, not, not sure that they're going to give her a ticket or anything, but. Put that attention to detail. That's what I love yeah. about your Thank writing. You. Mm -hmm. And um, I appreciate it. I have a respect. Thank you have you. Uh, somebody asked if you wrote the book with the audio in mind. Um, no, no, I didn't. Although I hear it in my head, like so. When I was writing, the, so this book, the Ju the book with Julia Child in it was, you know, Julia has a very unique voice mm -hmm. and personality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it was almost as terrifying writing Julia in a novel as it was writing Abe Lincoln in three novels because, well, we got TV of Julia. We know what she looks and sounds like. And that's both good and bad for me as a writer. Good because I can use that as a source, but bad because you all know what she sounds like and looks like. But she, the narrator has got it down. Yes, the narrator is she amazing. She sounds like for Julia this. Child. She does. Wow. She really does. Without without making it a caricature yeah. it it's sounds really, natural. really good she does a really good job of switching the to a male voice to the, the grandfather to the you know back to the girl she really has a range it's really well she's done. she's very her name is polly lee and she'll be doing the, the second book in the series as far oh, as i know yeah. but so you know when i was writing this trying to hear her voice in my head you know to make sure she sounded like julia like the julia i saw on tv um Back to the research, because you brought that up. Yeah. You know, people ask me a lot about the research that I do for the books that I'm writing, uh, the historical books, um, which is really all I'm writing now, which I'm very fine with. So when I was working on the Philip Bright series, the Agatha Christie Housekeeper series, I spent a lot of time researching what it was like to live in a big estate, you know, kind of like a Downton Abbey. But, you know, it's a little bit later. And again, this is all fictional. But what I what I mean is how the household was structured who had what role, what they did and what they had, you know, the ability to do and what it was actually like. So I read a lot of um, memoirs from people who lived in big households or worked as housekeepers or cooks or maids in these households. And I also, the best part of this research for this series was rereading all the Agatha Christie books because I had to re refresh myself about all of them because there's a lot of Agatha Christie Easter eggs in these books. There is a lot of like, if you know Christie, even if you just watched the David Suchet or Gil Poirot's, which love him. <laughs> um, and we'll talk about Kenneth Branagh in a minute because I have thoughts about Kenneth Branagh's. Um, you will, you'll, you'll catch a lot of the the hints and the, and the little, um, you know, Easter eggs about Agatha Christie. So um, a lot of the research was about that. And one of the things that made me very comfortable writing a housekeeper who solves mysteries is she really would have the time to do this. You don't think about, you think about, oh, she's going to be busy all the time, but actually a good housekeeper who has a good staff, and believe me, Philida has a good staff. She's an exacting housekeeper, actually has a lot of time because she has her staff. They know what they're supposed to do. And her job is really, you know, she deals with the vendors. She writes the checks. She does the meals. She, you know, she does a lot of the high level stuff, but she might have all afternoon free because, She's got a good staff that does everything. So I was able to justify for myself that she has the time to go running off and, and doing some of these investigative things, whereas maybe a cook wouldn't have the time to do that or a housekeeper in a smaller household wouldn't have the time to do that. So I was able to justify for myself and, and, and make myself feel comfortable that, yes, this is something that is somewhat realistic that Philida would have the time to do this. Plus, Agatha is all for it anyway, because there's a dead body in Agatha's house. She doesn't want the press climbing all over the house. So she was, you know, very happy for Phil to try and figure out who done it. I feel like there was another question or something. Yeah. You've written so many books. Mm. Are you do you write one at a time? Mm. Especially where you're changing points of view. Mm -hmm. Okay. So well, uh one time I didn't, and I'll never do that again. Uh, one time I wrote two books over together at the same like. Oh, Apparently. it was awful. And this was years ago. Um, yeah, I won't do that again. Yeah. So um, no. So right now I just finished, like I said, the fourth book in this series. And I'm thinking about the third book in the American and Paris series, which I will start writing in January. So right now I'm thinking about what I'm going to do for that book, starting to pre-research and stuff. 
How do you keep it straight? <laughs> well, you know, they're all very distinct. You know, they're pretty distinct. They're different time periods, different voices. And um, it's like, you know, watching different TV shows, you know, you, you know, they don't leak too much, but that's part of the reason I make them so different. You know, that's kind of how, why I do it. So, um, so I usually pre-thinking, pre-researching while I'm writing one, but I write one, take, you know, a couple weeks break and then start working on another and then take a couple weeks break. Cause if you get out of the habit, it's harder to get back into the habit. So I don't like to go too long without working, writing. I write four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, Wednesday, it's my favorite day of the week because I call it free day Wednesday and I can do whatever I want on free day Wednesday. I can go out to lunch. I can have a dentist appointment. I can, you know, um, do my errands and everything. And if I didn't write my words that I was supposed to write on Monday and Tuesday, I catch up on Wednesday. And if I don't write the words I'm supposed to write on Thursday and Friday, I catch up on the weekend. So that's kind of how I keep myself, you know, I'm not, you know, hacking away. I'm working hard, but I'm not, you know, I'm not hacking away. I don't know how to explain it any better than that. Does that make sense? You're not stressing yourself. Mm -hmm. You're structured. After 49 books, I figured out what wow. works for me yeah, and how, works. what process works for me. And it's different for everybody, but that's the process that works for me. Yes. Do you get a uh, writer's block? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I have three day Wednesdays and the weekends because so I, you know, I try to write somewhere about 2000 words a day on my writing days. And if I don't do that, then I have to catch up um, on the, on the extra days so that I hit my deadline. So yeah, there's a lot of, there are a lot of days where the words just don't want to cooperate, but um, since I do it for a living, I can't let that stop me for very long. Mm -hmm. So I have, I figured out ways to kind of get, get past writer's block. I've figured out ways, you know, how to, you know, just push through it. There's, there's a variety of things that, that I do um, to just try and move on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I read a biography or autobiography of Julia Child, and in the, around 1949, when they were in Paris, she and Paul kept going to all these French restaurants and exploring French cuisine, the range, the depth, and I'm wondering how much you know, how hungry we're going to get as oh, we read this will. book. Oh, you will, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, when she, when she got to, to France, she was not like a food, like a gourmand, like like we think mm -hmm. of her as now. She had met Paul. Some of you may know that she had met Paul in the Far East. They were worked for the OSS, which was the predecessor of the CIA. And um, they got to know each other there. And they would eat, you know, Asian food all the time. But she didn't have a taste for, for um, French food. And she had grown up eating American food, like we all did, or many of us did. You know, roasts and soups from Campbell's and all of that spam. Well, maybe some of us didn't eat spam, but you know what I'm saying. Um, but when she got to the very first meal in, in France, wasn't even in Paris, and she, it was like an, a, an epiphany for her. Whoa, this is like not just fuel, this is an experience. Mm -hmm. And then it took her a while, probably about six or so months before she realized she wanted to be able to cook like that. First, she would go around and eat and eat and eat. And then she realized she wanted to cook like that. And so she started taking lessons. So um, people asked me why I didn't put recipes in the back of this book. And I was like, well, this is Julia Child cooking. I am not putting her recipes in my book because they're her recipes. But what you do get in the book is you get her teaching you how to cook or teaching Tabitha how to cook. Mm -hmm. So you can learn, you learn some of her techniques and you learn basic information about, you know, how to make an omelet which she did famously on her first TV show, you know, how to make um, roasted chicken and things like that. So you're not going to get a recipe with measurements, but you're going to get the experience and you will be hungry. <laughs> I'm always hungry when I'm writing these books and I have her cookbooks and all of her stuff spread out in front of me so that I can find recipes. You know, like I said, she's not actually telling you measure how to measure, but she's explaining how to do it. So um, yeah, hopefully, Good. hopefully you'll all be hungry when you, when you read them, not if, when, oh. <laughs> Other questions? I don't know what time we are on time. Um, you're fine. Okay. Um, yeah. So you mentioned being a, a panther. Um, yeah. What happens if <laughs> you're sorry, walking through the grocery store and all of a sudden you get an idea? Do you, do you keep a notebook in your no. bag or it no. stays in your head? Mm, well, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> 
Me and my husband does it always. So you know what? Um, I when I was this is a roundabout answer to your question. I promise. Before I sold my first book, I worked. I was a sales manager for a health insurance company, and then I was a regional manager. And so I, um, you know, I had a busy job and um, I would drive, I had to drive a lot because sales and driving is the best way for me to get rid of writer's block. So if I'm trying to figure something out, I need to drive somewhere. Well, guess what? I write full time now. I don't drive anywhere. So I'm always trying to find excuses to take, you know, an hour drive to, you know, go visit somebody or, you know, go do something because when I have writer's block, that's what really helps me. Um, so if I'm walking through the grocery store and I get an idea, usually it's something that I've been trying to figure out. So I'm not going to forget it. Um, I do get ideas for new books, but I can't, you know, you know, totally unrelated to these. And I can't really, I don't have time to work on them right now. I write another series. So I do three books a year. I do one Philida Bright, Agatha Christie, one Julia Child, Tabitha Knight. And I do <laughs> this other, which Sherry knows about. The series called the Three Tomes Bookshop series, and it's just the fluffiest, lightest, kind almost goofy but fun series. It's about a woman who, on her forty eighth birthday, her whole life goes to hell. She loses her job. She was a librarian in the Chicago Library for years. She had a house she rented. She had a best friend, and all of a sudden, everything goes to hell, and her whole life is ruined. And at the same time, she inherits a little bookshop up in Northern Michigan in um, a thinly veiled Traverse City, Michigan. I don't know if anybody's ever been there. It's not really Traverse City, but it is. Anyway, this bookshop is very unique because characters come out of the books and they live in, in the bookshop. Mm -hmm. So the main the, the main character, her name is Jacqueline. Yeah. And um, she's takes over this bookshop and finds out right away that there's two people who already work there. And one of them is Mrs. Hudson, Sherlock Holmes's landlady. And the other one is Mrs. Danvers from Rebecca. Mm. And they live in the bookshop and they run this bookshop and she's just kind of the owner. She's along for that. So, but other characters come out of the books and it's just kind of a, I don't know what you call it. It's kind of a fun, a fun, very fantasy. light series. I'm sorry. Like a fantasy? Kind of. It's like, I don't know how to explain it. Characters come out of the books, but they have to go back in eventually because if they don't go back in, the books disappear. Oh. So in one of the books, Cinderella oh. comes out of the book and she meets the Artful Dodger who came out of Oliver Twist and they oh. want to run off and get married. And if they do not go back in their books, we're not going to have Oliver Twist or Cinderella anymore. That's like the high level of it. But anyway, so they're they're not mysteries. There's usually a problem that needs to be solved. They're very light. And they're called is Tomes, Scones, and Crones is the first one. Then there's Purses, Curses, and Hearses. Yeah. And then there's Steaks as in Vampire Steaks, Cakes, and Mandrakes. Anyway, those are, oh. those are um, that's the third book I write every year. So I do three books a year. So Are they geared more to a uh, young? No. The no. main character is 48 years old. Oh. He's a woman who is coming into her own. Life does not end at 50. I'm just going to, I'm here to tell you that right now. <laughs> and she's learning that. She That's the whole point. She's learning that, hey, I am a very worthwhile person, you know, even though I'm, a lot of people might write me off when I'm a woman who's almost 50 or, or older. So, so it's kind of a woman power book with a little bit of fantasy element to it. I don't know. I keep waiting for Hallmark to call me because it would be a great Hallmark series. Oh, and by the way, my fantasy for um, if this ever gets made into a TV show, not a movie, a TV show, Rachel Brosnahan, I want her to protect yeah, tonight. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, so I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> the universe. That's right. She's got time right now because everybody's on strike. She could be reading this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Anyhow, um, any other questions before we wrap up? Okay. I, I do have oh sorry go ahead sorry. no I'm just looking at okay I do have books for sale here I'm happy to sign them for you if you happen to purchase a book tonight I have these really cute little custom bookmarks that I made to go with the murder by invitation only so um I could take cash credit card Venmo or Zelle or PayPal so anyway if anybody's interested um, other than that, any other questions from anybody? Um, anybody from uh, up there in Tewksbury? I think you answered this. What do you think of holding a first-person narrator perspective or multiple first-persons? Well, yeah, so your limit when you're doing first-person, and that is always a very um, conscious decision that I have to make, because once I commit to first-person, that whole book, that whole series, I'm never going to have anybody else's, like, from their point of view. Um, 
So that's a commit. That's a big commitment. That's not to say that okay, down the road, you know, there might be a way to, to add in a third, you know, uh, per, uh, third party or second party's um, perspective. But it is a decision that I make consciously. Um, so partly because I don't know why I made that decision. I really don't know. I, it felt right, I guess. Um, yes. So that is a decision I made consciously. And I, I've only written two series in first person, and that would be the American in Paris series and also the um, Stoker and Holmes series, Sherlock's niece and Bram Stoker's sister. I alternate their points of view in first person. So I kind of got away with having two points of view in that one. But it is a commitment to go to first person. And um, it's something I had to think about whether I really wanted to do it. But that's just another challenge mm -hmm. to the writing. So that's fun, too. Someone wants to know the titles of the bookshop mystery. Tomes, Scones, and Crones is the first one. And the uh, name of the series is the Three Tomes Bookshop Series. If they go to ColleenGleason.com or ColleenCambridge.com, all of the books are on there. Um, you, you might be able to find them that way too. But Tomes, Scones, and Crones is the first one. Okay. They're also on audio if anybody's interested. We have all, I think we have all your books because of from after the first time I, I know we have the um, Lincoln White House. You probably don't have the Tomes, Scones, and Crones because yeah. they're little mass market size. Okay. But, but I, know, I know they're on Hoopla. I'm pretty sure they're on Hoopla. Right, Those the to, the three bookshops, three Tom's bookshop are on Hoopla. Ooh. So I'm pretty um, sure. People are saying I'm loving this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Um, a great entertaining. Great. Thank great, you. Great entertainer. <laughs> well, I appreciate it very much, and I appreciate it. if you read any of my books and you enjoy them, I ask that you just tell somebody else. Give them as a gift to somebody else. You know, help support because people will ask me how many books do you plan to write in the series. I'll write them as long as my publisher wants to keep publishing them. And you are all, you know, part of that. If you, if the library brings them in and you all take them out, you know, if you tell people about them, that all really helps because then there's more demand and then they know that there's people wanting and reading the books. Well, I think tonight's attendance shows that. Yeah, it's very, very happy. happy. Yeah, I'm very appreciative yes. of that. <laughs> oh, so one more thing before we wrap up. I did want to say, um, I did mention that the Egg of the Christie themed uh, series has a little bit, you know, have a, have a lot of Agatha Christie Easter eggs in them. But I did want to say that each book is a definite homage, at least the setup, to an Agatha Christie novel. So this one, The Body in the Library, kind of obvious. And then there's a bunch of other little, um, you know, uh, Easter, like, you know, hints in it. This one starts off the same way as, I always forget the title of this one, Appointment with Death. If you know Appointment with Death, Hercule Poirot overhears someone talking about killing someone. Mm -hmm. So that's how this one starts. And this one is fun because, and some of you read this, this one's fun because it, it takes place at a murder mystery fate mm -hmm. in England. You know, they have their fates. This is a murder mystery writer um, get together and somebody dies. So you've got a whole bunch of murder mystery writers who are suspects and trying to figure out who done it. And that was kind of fun. And also this is really an homage besides the, you know, the beginning, the setup, the solution is an homage to another Christie novel, but if I tell you what it is, then you'll know the solution, and I don't want to spoil that. <laughs> <laughs> this book, which comes out tomorrow, um, is uh, an homage to A Murder is Announced, which is my very favorite Miss Marple, and so basically they receive an invitation, which some of you got. Did you open your little invitations? Yeah. Well, that's what is in this book. That's what starts this book off, basically. So anyhow, that was all. I just wanted to mention that to, uh, sure. to all in some um, I don't see any other questions. Anybody in Zoom? <laughs> if you have, this is it. Going, going, gone. Anybody else? Live Zoom people. Thank you for the coming tonight. The people here live are going to be able to talk to her. So, um, Robert, th this was a great program. Great. Um, thanks for doing it again. And thanks to everybody that participated tonight. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I can yep. We no, really, really appreciate and um, I feel like I owe you a, a lobster roll because oh, I, yeah. lobster roll. <laughs> I, I, I did mention this. I stopped at the Schlesinger Library on my way here today to look at Julia Child's paper. Like she, they That's have all right. the papers there, all of her letters and everything. So I spent about a couple hours there today, which was so it was a double. Double whammy of a day. Got up at four thirty this morning, y'all, and I'm still going. <laughs> so thank you, Sue. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate y'all coming. Yes. Bye -bye. Good night, everybody.